All of us need help from time to time. If you're looking for individual, one-on-one -on -one mental health counseling, I want to tell you about an incredible resource called Faithful Counseling. It is professional Christian counseling done securely online from the privacy of your own home. Faithful Counseling will assess your individual needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist for a weekly video or phone session. As a listener of the Marriage Day podcast, they are offering you a special discount of 10% off your first month. To get started, visit getfaithful.com forward slash marriage today. That's getfaithful.com forward slash marriage today. Welcome to Marriage Today podcast. I'm Karen and this is my husband Jimmy and guess what we're talking about today? What are we talking about? Intimacy. Physical and uh, spiritual intimacy. Mm -hmm. That's right. We are. Yeah. And I have a great question for you. Okay. I opened my dream business. My wife supported the decision, but now she complains I spend too much time at work. I'm frustrated. Well, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I opened, uh, I opened my dream business. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't seem like she's very connected. Yeah. There. Okay. <sighs> And then my wife supported the decision, but now she complains I spend too much time at work. It doesn't matter that it's your dream business. You have you have a dream marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're gonna if you're going to be able to have a successful marriage, it always has to be first. But it, it'd be like saying a wife saying, "I had my dream child, you know, and now my husband complains all I do is raise that child." It would be just as wrong. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how much you enjoy something. You have to keep the priority of your marriage. Marriage can't work unless it's in first place. So when a wife is complaining, she's trying to get your heart. Mm -hmm. She's not nagging. She's fighting for the integrity of the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying this, if, if your business, for your business to succeed, if it causes your marriage to fail, you need to give that business up, mm -hmm. okay? It's, it's a bad business. But you shut the door, go home, have a happy wife and a successful business and trust God. Yeah, that's good. Okay, this is a question to you from one of our listeners. My husband doesn't like to pray in front of other people, even before meals. How can I help give him the confidence he needs? It's a good question. I know for you, when we first got married, it was hard for you to pray too. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, prayer is just talking, it's just a relationship with God. Yeah. You know, it's not religious, it's not you know, you have to know all the right words. It's just asking Father God who loves us and wants the best for us, yeah. who tells us that if he takes care of the birds, how much more does he want to take care of us? So when you have that kind of concept in your mind that God's good, he's faithful, he's kind, he's generous, he's patient, you want to talk to him, you know? And so, you know, it's just simple, maybe encourage just the two of them to get together and pray instead of in a group at the beginning, because you use saying meals. Yeah. You know, so maybe just, you know, ask him how he's doing at work. Say, you know, how do you feel about that? And say, let's just pray about it. Yeah. And then, you know, because there's many times I've counseled girls and they don't know how to pray. And I say, so let's pray. I said, I want you to pray first. Well, when you're in circumstances that are difficult, you, you do want to ask God. Because yeah. people love to have prayer. If I go to someone and say, do you want me to pray for you about that? Of course they want prayer. Yeah. You know, and so I think it's just a matter of just doing it until it's comfortable. Well, it, it's hard for a lot of men to do it because it doesn't come natural. Mm -hmm. They, you know, it's embarrassing, and you don't know if you're saying the right thing. So, mm -hmm. one of the things you might think about is writing a prayer down, and just saying, "Honey, would you mind just reading this prayer before dinner?" That's a good idea. And if he if he started, first of all, it would help him understand the, what she's wanting, mm -hmm. and then secondly, all he has to do is read. He didn't have to think. <laughs> It was, I'm, I mean, I remember the days that that was very terrifying to mm -hmm. me uh, to pray like that, but that's good. Okay, well, if you have a question, send it in to marriagedaypodcast.com. Hope that you've enjoyed this, and here comes the teaching. The word intimacy means inner closeness. That's what it means. It means close on the inside. In fact, let me just read you a definition here. It means depth of relationship, complete mutual awareness, and unhindered access to another person. It means I know you. I know who you are. I have access to your thoughts. I have access to your emotions. I have access to your body. I have access to you. And so intimacy means closeness on the inside, not just on the outside. Now in Genesis chapter 2, when God created marriage, He created man and woman and marriage. This is what God said, For this cause a man will leave his father and mother and will cleave unto his wife, 
and they too will become one flesh. And then verse 24 says, the, the verse 25 says, the man and his wife were both naked and unashamed. Now in marriage on the rock, I talk about the four foundational laws of marriage. Okay. In this message, I'm going to talk about the four essential elements of intimacy. If you're going to have closeness on the inside, if you're going to be able to know each other and have unhindered access, no fear, no, nothing to, to hinder your intimacy at all, four things have to be present. The first is value. For this cause, a man will leave his mother and his father. Marriage has to, marriage causes us to reprioritize our lives. The Bible says, for this cause a man will leave the most important thing in his life. Before you get married, the most important relationship you have is with your mother and your father. Okay, and it says, for this cause you have to leave. And the word leave there doesn't mean abuse, forsake, anything like that. It means let go. It's the word azab. It just means reprioritize. And so literally, a covenant marriage that God puts together spirit to spirit is more profound than a blood bond. And what that means is it has to be first. I'm putting a high, the highest value on you. And going back to the law of priority, which is the first law of marriage, marriage has to be first. It has to be before your children it, in real terms. It has to be before your job. It has to be before your friends. It has to be before, you know, golf is what almost, you know, ruined our marriage. And I, I golf so much, or it almost ruined our marriage. And what saved our marriage is I hung up my golf clubs. It, but what it said to Karen is, you're first. And so you have, intimacy begins with value. Now listen, love is our greatest need. Rejection is our greatest fear. We, we all fear. When you go back into a person's life, and I've done a lot of counseling for many years, a person's greatest damage is always done through rejection. You know, whether it was a previous divorce or rejection of a, a, a person earlier in your life or whatever, that's because love is our greatest need. So value says something in a relationship which is critical to establish intimacy. And there's, that's, there's nothing more important than you. Except for Jesus Christ, nothing in my life is more important than you. Number two, the essential element of intimacy is energy. For this man, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, reprioritize, and cleave unto his wife. Well, you know, the, the word cleave is not a common word in the English language. You think of meat cleaver, and that's not a pretty picture, you know, related to marriage. I mean, you might have come to your mind a few times when you were fighting, but <laughs> the word cleave is the word dabak. In the Hebrew language, it means to like climb a mountain. It's an energy word. Uh, five times in the book of Deuteronomy, we're commanded to cleave unto the Lord our God. That means you grab onto and pursue with all of your energy. Jesus said, seek and you'll find. Knock, the door will be open. It's an, there's an energy in pursuing a relationship with God, and there's an energy in pursuing a relationship with each other. In other words, marriage is work. You know, and, and some people think, if I marry my perfect soulmate, I have to, won't have to work at it. Well, that's just baloney. From the very beginning, God, and, and specifically, it talk, it's talking to men here. It says, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. We work hard at the relationship you know, honestly and truly, if you marry your perfect soulmate, you're going to have to work at the relationship. Some people believe, and I believe that this is just kind of a, a romantic misconception in our society that's perpetuated by the entertainment industry. Some people believe if you have to work at it, there's something wrong with your relationship. If you have to work at it, you have a, a normal marriage. You, have, you, you married a normal person. So it, it requires energy. The number three thing that it requires is sacrifice is it says, they too shall become one flesh. The only way that two things can become one is the surrender of everything for the relationship. Jesus says, if, if any of you will not give up all of his own possessions, you can't be my disciple. In other words, if we're going to have oneness with Jesus, it means that we come to Jesus and bring everything into the relationship. So see, I, I marry you and, and I say, well, I'll give you everything except this. You're going to hate that thing I won't give you. That thing that I won't give you is going to keep us from being one. It's a natural resentment we have for anything in our spouse's life that is not included in the relationship with us. So I'm willing to sacrifice. Jesus sacrificed to create a covenant with us, and we have to sacrifice to create a covenant with each other. And by the way, the word covenant means to cut. 
It, it, it means a sacrificial, permanent relationship. And any time that there was a covenant in the Bible, there was always blood. That's, that's the, you get what you pay for in relationships. If you want an easy out, easy in, easy out relationship, that's not what covenant is. Covenant means till death do us part. I'm willing to sacrifice for this relationship. God cut Adam and took his rib out and created Eve and created marriage. He just as easily could have created Eve out of the dust. But he was saying something, and that is the nature of marriage is sacrifice. Number four, essential element of marriage is trust. The man and his wife were both naked and were unashamed. They, they had no fear. The, the word ashamed there means to be, to be put to shame. There was nothing in their relationship that kept them from being completely exposed to each other. Now understand, when sin came into the Garden of Eden, that all changed. When sin came into the garden, then they were ashamed. And they hid from God, and they hid from each other. And the beautiful intimacy that they had was out the window. And, and by the way, when God came to Adam and said, what is this that you've done? He said, she is the one who is responsible for this. And he blamed Eve, and then Eve blamed the devil. And it was just your basic nightmare. All the trust was gone from the relationship. So value, energy, sacrifice, and trust. We're going to use an acronym here. It's invest. We're all through. We're going to talk about the four areas of intimacy. And we're going to use an acronym. Invest. Intimacy necessitates. Value, energy, sacrifice, and trust. That's the word invest. If we're going to be intimate, it means we must have value, energy, sacrifice, and trust. My wife and I have been married for over 47 years. And during the first few years of our marriage, we had tremendous problems. In fact, we almost divorced. But the Lord supernaturally healed our marriage. When the Lord healed our marriage, He took me to Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. And He just impressed on me to read those verses. And when I read them, they really didn't mean anything to me, but I just kept reading them over and over. And finally, I saw that there were four laws of marriage in those verses. And when I began to understand the four laws of marriage or the four laws of love, it transformed our marriage. In my latest book, The Four Laws of Love, it's the culmination of everything I've learned over the years. In this deeply personal audiobook, I outline the foundational pillars upon which God designed marriage. You can now find The Four Laws of Love on Audible. I personally narrated the whole audiobook. You can listen while working from home, cooking, exercising, on a walk, or even together as a couple. Audible is a leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find all of my audiobooks, including Marriage on the Rock and Tipping Point. You can also find titles from other XO publishers like Dave and Ashley Willis. With an Audible membership, you can download them and listen offline anytime, anywhere. Now new members can try Audible Plus for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash marriage or text marriage to 500-500. That's audible.com slash marriage or text marriage to 500-500. Let's begin with spiritual intimacy, creating spiritual intimacy. A sense of unity and mutual commitment to God's purpose for our lives and marriage and respect for the special dreams of each other's hearts. It's really, it's really uh, the closest, the, the greatest depth of intimacy we experience in marriage. V, value. I value God's purpose for your life and the dreams of your heart. Now, uh, marriage, a godly marriage is a win-win proposition. We both get there. I, as a man, I am called by God to nourish and cherish you as I would my own body. Those are agricultural words. The word nourish means to feed to maturity, and the word cherish means to keep warm like a plant. A husband's role in the marriage is to be God's partner to bring his wife to her full potential of what God created in her mother's womb to become. Chauvinism is just simply the belief that men are more special. Men are more important. You're here for me. You take care of me and my life means something. That's not a godly marriage. A godly marriage is two people created in God's image with calls on their lives getting together and we're a team to both get to our full potential in God individually and together. I value the fact that you were created in your mother's womb to make a difference in this world and I'm your dream maker, not your dream breaker. 
Number two, energy. I commit to pursuing God personally and together to find and fulfill God's call on my life, your life, and our marriage. Now, we teach people how to do a vision retreat. And, uh, and we have a resource that helps people to have a vision retreat. And what we encourage people to do is go away for three or four or five days every year. Spend the mornings praying about your marriage. Praying about your lives, your marriage, your children, your finances, every single area of your life. And it takes energy. And I'm talking about energy now. Is spending the energy to pray together. Now, Karen and I pray together a lot. We've prayed together, you know, thousands of times in our marriage. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of answered prayers. Let me say, you're either going to pray or you're going to worry. And spiritual intimacy, when you invite God into a circumstance, you're not going to fight about it. And when God comes through and does a miracle, it's going to be a bonding experience in your marriage. If you don't pray, you're going to fight. Philippians 4 says, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace that passes comprehension will guard your heart and your mind. The word guard there is the word phureo in the Greek. It means a military guard. When you pray about everything, you're not anxious for anything. We're not going to let anxiety and stress into our marriage. The answer is prayer. The answer is to trust someone greater than us. Matthew 18 says, if two on earth would agree together as touching anything they would ask, it would be done for them. That means a man and a woman. A man and a woman holding hands, praying for about their children, praying about their job, praying about the finances, praying about anything. You have the ability to shake heaven simply through your prayers. If two on earth and the peace of God, the peace of God that passes all comprehension, you shouldn't have this much peace going through what you're going through. But the reason that you have this peace is rather than fighting about it or separating over it, you prayed and you invited God into that circumstance and now the spiritual bond between you gets even closer. You, pray, you, you work at praying. You make sure that you're worshiping together, you're praying together, you're seeking God. Number three, I sacrifice the desire to only promote myself or to worry about myself. In other words, we're, we're each other's, God looked at Adam by himself, and God said, it's not good that he's alone. You understand the devil never attacked Adam when he was by himself. And Adam was on the earth for a significant period of time by himself because the Bible said he named every animal on earth before Eve was created. Let me tell you, that takes a while. I tried it once. <laughs> They're still finding new species. And Adam, Adam named every species of animal on earth, and it says, and there was no one found comparable to him. And so God created a woman. And then the devil attacked. The devil attacked because now Adam could get there. Eve was created to help Adam get there. Adam was created to help Eve get there. And both of us have to sacrifice our natural selfishness that we only care about ourselves. Number four is trust. I will create an atmosphere where you can share your deepest spiritual desires and dreams and know that they're honored by me. Okay? That I'll respect that. that. That I'll be careful with this. Now this is an interesting thing. Research proves that our deepest fights are on a dream level. That when we're having our worst fights, we're, we're on a dream level. An example is uh, a person who dreams of financial security, like Karen. Karen, Karen dreams of financial security. Not in a bad way, not in a materialistic way. I was her dream breaker. Because I did not value the finances the way she did. I was her dream breaker. I didn't understand that. Housework, you know, to have an orderly, peaceful life. Some people, their dream is just to have a, a nice home and a, a home that's well cared for, but their spouse is, is not respectful of that. So you're, you're not just being a slob. You're attacking a dream that your spouse has. Children. To have children who are a priority and feel loved by their parents. Some, some people grew up without both parents. Some people grew up in a broken home or a home where there was high dysfunction. And their dream is to have an orderly home where the children are valued by their parents. Not too highly because the marriage has to come first. But you're never here. You don't take care of the kids. Blah, blah, blah. And so you're my dream breaker. One of Karen's dreams is, is living without a lot of stress. Um, because of what I've done for many years in the ministry, um, we had a tremendous amount of stress in our home when our kids were growing up. 
my schedule, uh, the church, and you know, I was uh, pastoring a large church and uh, marriage today started and there was a lot of stress and Karen uh, reacted to that. And Karen's an extremely hard worker. I mean, she's, she is a very, very diligent person. I can handle stress, but she can't. And, and I, I say I can handle it. I, I don't handle it as well as I say I do, but I can handle it better than she can. But what I realized was that one of Karen's dreams is for us to have manageable lives that are not too stressed out. And so what I've done over the years is I've made her my partner with my schedule. And before I put a lot of things on my schedule, I sit down and talk to Karen and say, is this okay? Is this okay? We talk about my schedule, you know, two or three times a week. And she'll say, yeah, I'm fine. Her not having that stress on her that me being busy and us being busy creates, that's one of her dreams. I was her dream breaker, now I'm her dream maker. Because I care about the fact that that's super important to her. A lot of the fights that we have, we just don't realize we're touching each other's dream. It's not just an emotional level. It's not just a mental level. It's a spiritual level. There's something deep within my heart that cries out for this. And you're my dream breaker. And if we're going to have intimacy in our relationship... We've got to be each other's dream maker and listen and work at that. Number four, this is the last one, physical intimacy. Feeling as though your partner's body is your place of pleasure and delight. Closely sharing physical needs and desires and giving yourself to physically serve your spouse. I'm going to go through the little acronym here. Intimacy necessitates value. I care about your physical needs. Energy. I commit my physical energies to meeting your needs. Let me read you a scripture here. Interesting. 1 Corinthians 7, 4, okay? It says, when you get married, you don't have authority over your own body, but your spouse does. That's not a license for abuse. It's a license for use. What the Apostle Paul is saying, this is profound now. He says, when you get married, your spouse has authority over your body to get their needs met. It's not a license for abuse now. But it means it's not your body anymore. It's your spouse's body. That's how profound the Bible is when it says, they too shall become one flesh. Now, when you, when you withhold your body from your spouse, it's devastating to the relationship. If I use it as a weapon, if, if I use it as a bargaining chip, if I, whatever it is, if I withhold my body from you, it's going to be devastating to the relationship. Now, when, when people hear, when spouses hear that their body belongs to your spouse, men, men think different than women. Women think different than men. Men think sex. Oh, boy. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And um, women don't think that. Women think service. Oh boy, he has to take the trash out. He has to fetch and tote. Oh boy, I get to tell him anything to do. So women were asked, when is your husband most sexually attractive to you? And in their response, they almost always say when he's doing housework. My husband is most attractive to me when he's doing housework. Okay. This is your place of pleasure and delight. The word Eden means pleasure and delight. God made marriage to be a place of pleasure and delight. This is your place of pleasure and delight. And it means two things. Service and affection. I will serve you with my body. Karen, Karen and I's marriage, and Karen's a servant and so am I. We just serve each other all day. You know, marriage is about being together. It's not about living separate lives on different sides of the house. It's about doing things together. So I'll be emptying the trash. She'll be taking care. You know, she'll be cooking a meal. I'll fold the clothes. I'll do this. I'll do that. But Karen, a hundred times, you know, a day, you know, Karen will say, hey, Jimmy, will you do this? Or Jimmy, will you do this? And I'll say to Karen, hey, would you mind doing this? Yeah, great. Why? Because we serve each other. That this, I'm giving you my body. And that means it's your body. For the sake of getting your needs met, whether it's affection or whether it is, uh, you know, service. I will sacrifice other desires and personal comfort to meet your needs. I'll come home tired from work, you know, and I'll walk in the door and, you know, Karen will say, and rather than Karen saying, you poor baby, go over there and sit down. I'll take care of you. Karen will say, I need this, 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 and this. <laughs> you know, and sometimes I'm just thinking, woman, I'm out, you know, saving the world from sin. <laughs> And you just need to, you know, be careful how you treat the Lord's anointed. <laughs> but I have to fold the clothes and take out the trash and do all that stuff, you know. 
I will create an atmosphere where you can share any request of me physically and know that it will be honored and met. This is your body. This is your body. And if we're going to have intimacy, it means four levels, value, energy, sacrifice, and trust, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events. Romance is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the marriage relationship, but it's absolutely critical. For a marriage to be vibrant and dynamic, you must have romance present in the relationship every day. As a Marriage Today podcast listener, we want to give you a free ebook that is an excerpt from my new book, The Four Laws of Love. The free ebook is called The Four Elements of Romance, and you can get it now by texting Marriage Today, one word, to 31996. Get the free ebook now by texting Marriage Today to 31996.